Good, good evening to you. We're going to start this evening in Genesis chapter 11. If you want to turn to that text, other texts will at least put the references on the screen and have those listed in the bulletin too, but Genesis 11 is where we'll start. Just a moment. I do thank each and every one of you for your presence here tonight. It's a great crowd and an enjoyable time always to sing together, to worship together, to pray together, to study with one another. Magicians have any number of tactics by which they can carry out a single trick. And so you take one card trick or one disappearance act and, and he or she might use a multitude of different tactics in order to achieve that deception. And so if you go to the, the master class website, that's a, a website trying to sell classes from those who are kind of most popular or most famous for certain crafts. And so they offer a class, probably a multitude of classes on magic and, and one features pen and teller. And so on that uh, site, kind of the, the site to sell that class, they talk some about the concept of misdirection, one of the single tactics you might use in any given trick. And so misdirection is getting the audience to focus on one thing while doing another. So they say this, the key to misdirection is that the audience is unaware that it's happening. It feels, the audience feels, that its attention was precisely where it wanted it to be throughout the performance. What they say is the audience comes in knowing the whole goal of magic is to deceive. And so you ask any audience member, what you look at? What you focus on? And they, oh, I was looking for the trick. I was looking for how it was going to work. Well, guess who knows that? The magician. And so the magician intentionally gets the attention going one direction in order to achieve something else in a different direction. And they're operating off of how we have limited attention spans. We, more or less, can only focus on one thing at any given time. Inintentional blindness is kind of the technical term for how we just only have capacity to focus on one input for the most part at any given time. And so magicians do this to make certain the audience sees only what they want it to see at all times. They can focus on an object or a person or an action. They will not process any other visual inputs including whatever it is the magician is doing to make the trick. But then there's another layer to all of this, and that is the role of, of social input, social influence. That as social creatures, all the focus on the magician, the, the audience follows his cues instinctually, instinctively. So the magician looks at something else. That's how he draws the audience's attention there. The magician turns and looks at the audience. The audience looks back, looks back at him or her. But that also works from audience member to audience member. That as they see one another looking at a given input, a given factor, then they too were drawn to that. And so here's what they say. The audience plays a big role in this way. The audience with its limited attention is actually complicit in its own deception. So as Teller likes to say, obviously he's the only one who would say this because Penn doesn't talk, the strongest lie is the lie that the audience tells itself. The strongest lie is the lie the audience tells itself. And so they might come in thinking, we can figure this out. We'll, we'll study carefully. We're not going to be tricked. We're going to focus. And all those thoughts keep building and building, and they essentially keep lying and keep being deceived, and it keeps compounding and building until the magician reveals you've been duped. We talked last week about how the worst and most consequential lie behind any sin, we're applying it to sexual sin and even more directly this moral revolution or moral agenda. But the strongest lie about any sin is that we're too far away from the hand of God to forgive us. That keeps us enslaved. Uh, what a tragedy to know that, that what sin is, to know what sin costs, to know that, that God offers forgiveness, but that we think God won't forgive me. That's the most dangerous lie we could ever believe. But another dangerous lie, and one of the most consequential lies of our given culture, is how collectively the culture has made behaviors more than behaviors. And now begun to equate behavior with identity, existence. It's not just an action, it's not just a repeated action, but it's actually tied to, quote, who I am. 
quote, who I was made to be. That misdirection has all sorts of consequences because it very often keeps us from ever seeking forgiveness or seeking the knowledge of what God desires because someone can start with this thinking that says, this is just who I've been created to be. With this deception, this misdirection, also comes any number of other consequences and and accompanying threats, accompanying means of deception. Most of which has to do with this simple language we use to talk about ourselves. So just quickly, looking at this lie on the screen, the behaviors are more than just behaviors. There's, it's just identity, who we are. Who wants us to believe that? Who wants us to believe that things that are destructive, things that are harmful, things that are sinful actually are our, our identity. They're who, they're who we are. We have no doubt have been guilty of this same thinking before. We might have said, once a thief, always a thief. Once an adulterer, always an adulterer. Once a, a cheat, always a cheat. Once a liar, always a liar. But we, as those who've been forgiven by the blood of Christ, know that's, that's not always the case. Some do stay locked into those sins, but that doesn't mean it has to remain their identity, right? Who is it that loves it when we confuse the two? Is it God? No, our spiritual enemy loves it when we begin to make these swaps and believe the misdirection. He loves it when we can take something that's a behavior or repeated behavior and say, no, this is, this is actually who I am because it begins to lock us in and keeps us from seeing the need for God in the first place. Now, this becomes important as we do begin to, to apply this to this sexualized culture we live in with with certain specific aspects of a moral revolution and moral change that's attempting to happen. And so what we have found is that it's almost the the, the peak, the success point of their agenda has now been realized because sex is no longer just something that they equate with love or maybe with with fun or with passion, but now it's, it's life. That who I am is defined by my sexuality, by a, a made-up kind of concept of orientation that's really not an accurate term. And so we have to work carefully and live carefully in an era where those misdirections have become more and more effective. And so because of that, there's this race by those behind all of this to keep redefining things so the behaviors no longer sound like behaviors, so that sin no longer sounds like sin so as to avoid judgment and avoid confrontation about these very things. Now let's look quickly at Genesis 11 just to see the process that that can happen and and how it relates to language. So notice just how tempting it is for us to seek to make a name for ourselves. This is what they do after the flood, Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel incident. Let's read verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, typically in the Old Testament, when you see east, that's a, an ominous signpost for away from God, direction away from God. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens The third thing they say, let us do, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. There you see the end of verse 4, their their chief transgressions. Let us make for ourselves a name for ourselves. And let's avoid becoming spread out. Let's come together all in one place. Verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one language, and they all have, or one people, they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do that's not complimentary. Nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Again, that's not complimentary. It's God saying it's getting dangerous. That the more they view life with this selfish ambition, the more power they use to harm others. Let's go back to the chief offenses. Make a name for ourselves 
We don't want to spread out all over the world. We want to be all together as one. We might interpret, especially that second idea, maybe as a good thing, and yet remember how God created the world. And this is following the flood, and, and there's been this reboot, this restart. And when God created the world, he said, you as human beings need to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, exercise dominion over all the earth. And so we see from the outset, their desires were against God's desires. We want to do all of this for ourselves. We want to make a name and get the glory for ourselves. And we want to resist God's design to fill the earth with his glory and with his people. And we want to do all of this ourselves. We want to build up and up and up and up and let the earth and the heavens be ours. And so they're acting in a way that's clearly against the will of God. Now, you see God's response. We've already read some of it. He's beginning to undo all the things that they've set out against him. They say, let us go up to God, and, and God says, let us go down. That's just proving that God's always more superior. No matter our attempts to replace God, no matter our attempts to, to reach into the, the realms of God, God, God's always more powerful, more superior. He's always going to have his way to win out. But also, you'll notice just how the very structure of the language is showing how we have this tendency to turn ourselves against God and seek our will through selfish ambition. They desired to stay within their own safe place. They, they thought they were the source of security, that we can, we can create all of this for ourselves. And so they, they turned inward instead of turning toward God. But notice what God does, beginning verse number 7. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over all the face of the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now here's God's response in order to protect the innocent, in order to preserve the possibility for his will of filling the earth, there's this confusion that happens with the level of language. They're stopped dead in their tracks because they cannot understand one another. Now, here's where this kind of begins to impact us. We've learned ever since that if we want to try to achieve projects of selfish ambition, we have to try to, quote, control the language. That the language of dispersion and the language of, of pockets and, and not having these revolutionary ideals. Well, okay, you don't have to speak the same language. But if we want to try to achieve success, and if we especially want to try to change what already does exist, then we need to achieve some sort of newfound agreement about language. See, they started off having one language, and so that becomes mankind's goal. Let's try to have one language so that we can reestablish values and reestablish direction and change. And so any revolution that gets off the ground, no matter how terrible, maybe even some of the most terrible, begins with the redefining and the changing of language. When you take the, the big dominant government movements, of, say communism and Marxism and fascism, even though in many ways they're kind of different sides of the spectrum in terms of their approach, they still, they still redefine language. There's propaganda, there's misdirection, and the people who follow after them are those who think they're they're participating in good things. They're, they're participating in that which gives people more rights and opportunities. And yet it's a funneling of power and a funneling of resources at those who want to use it for the worst. So think about now how that begins to impact this moral revolution as it relates to the sexualization of our culture. And think about some of the, the language that's used by God about God's on people in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 5 is the, this parable of how God has given Judah the best to make a vineyard. Well, what do you expect with the best aspects of a vineyard? You expect the best grapes. And he says, well, what did I find? I found grapes that just like, look, look just like the rest of the known world. I, I looked for great grapes, for special grapes, and I found wild grapes. Well, here's one of the, the clusters of grapes. 
Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. A swapping of language. Who put darkness for light, light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Do you hear it? Let us, let us seek to make a name for ourselves and shrewd in their own sight. You fast forward to the end of the book, chapter 59. You remember that's the chapter that opens by saying you're not lost because God's arm is short. Or because his ears are stopped up, you're lost because it's your iniquities, your sin that's created a separation between you and God. Listen to some of the statements in that chapter. Verse 8. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. Again, why does God care about this so much? Because, because when truth is violated, justice suffers. They have made the roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. The paths they've made for themselves have led them away from God and thus led them away from peace. This does no justice. The innocent suffer. Verse 14, justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Those who long to do the right things, those who long to live with ethics, those who, who long to live by justice can't go in the public squares because truth has fallen apart in those places. Verse 15, truth is lacking. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. That sounds like an anti-proverb. You go to the, the, the book of Proverbs and you find so often that those who, who depart from wickedness, depart from evil, will be blessed by God, right? Those who, who walk in the way of truth, who walk in the way of goodness, they'll be, they'll be blessed by God. But what he's saying is, in a context where truth is not honored, where, where justice isn't carried out, then those who do live by truth are the ones who are attacked. You, you want to stand out in a culture that doesn't lift up truth, and you, you live by truth. And you're now you're the one who is on the offensive. The Lord saw it, it displeased him that there was no justice. Now listen carefully. These condemnations are about God's people. They're about those who live in Judah. These are warnings coming from Isaiah. But where did they get? these attitudes? How do they adopt a language that begins to swap good and evil and darkness and light and bitter and sweet? How did it come to be that Judah or Jerusalem would be places where truth is not honored in the public square and where the righteous are mistreated? It didn't happen because they, they read about it in Genesis or, or Deuteronomy. It didn't happen because they listened to their priests read Leviticus. It didn't happen because they spent so much time in the Psalms. It happened because they kept opening their ears and their lives to the nations that were around them. And they kept wanting to fit in and they kept thinking that those nations were their source of security. And that if we offend them, then, then who knows what might happen to us. And slowly that process of misdirection led to where their language has been transformed and their very behaviors have become transformed. And now they are far away from God. In the realm of Sexual sin. Listen to how clear Paul is in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles. We might be quick to, if we were writing this, to just stop there. Well, we're supposed to look different and act different from the outside world. Why is it that those who are Christians, those whom he's writing to and, and are to be sanctified and control their bodies in holiness, why are they to be different than the Gentiles who act out of their own passions? Notice the qualifier. It's going to be a, a participle in the Greek. Like the Gentiles... Who don't know God? When there's an exchange such that the knowledge of God begins to evaporate. And the knowledge of the one who made us, truly made us in truth. 
when that evaporates, then so too the parameters for how to live and how to control ourselves evaporate alongside it. See, what we find is that both sexuality and language, they're fundamental to the survival of any civilization. Without procreation, you can't survive. Without communication, you can't survive. What's happened is both of those become twisted together out of a rejection of the one who's given them to us. You know, if we kind of survey across the centuries and even the millennia, if I just said the word bath tonight, B-A-T-H, there's nothing that seems offensive about that. Nothing seems sinful about a bath. It's a common part of a, a daily routine of the average person. What about in the context of the ancient Roman culture? Roman baths were the hot seat of sexual depravity. In a public square, a place that, that had the name of, of hygiene, of cleanliness, was far from a place of cleanliness. It was a place of debauchery and spiritual uncleanness. You see the language? What should have been a place, a term that was used for something good and helpful, actually became the name associated with a place of debauchery. And so we see just as time goes on, more and more that process begins to happen. Sigmund Freud is typically regarded as the, the shifting point, the pivot point in Western culture because he attempted to try to differentiate human beings from animals. And so more or less... His processes led him to believe, his dominant theory was, well, human beings are greater than animals because they, they participate in sexuality for far more than procreation. It's an emotional experience. It's a commitment. And so he thought, well, that must be it. That must be the chief value. You want to know how we came to believe that, that sex equals life or sex equals identity? There you go. It's him saying, this is what makes us better than animals. Well, why could he say that? Because he didn't start with God in mind at all. He started to seek a name for ourselves as human beings. And so therefore he processed everything through that lens of, of quote, sexual dysfunction because it came down to, to identity. We kind of keep going forward in our culture. We see how we may have even kind of fallen prey a little bit like Judah. And some issues that are not necessarily on the forefront of, of the sexual moral revolution right now, but they, they were a couple of decades ago. Think of how many things have been watered down. Do you hear terms like explicit or pornographic very much anymore? What about mature or adult? See, it's a, a swapping. Certain things are not appropriate for anybody, no matter their age. They're not adult, they're sinful. You go on down the list, no longer talk in terms of adultery or fornication, but it's, it's an affair, it's a casual affair, it's a friendship, it's a mistake. Or maybe the terms just like sleeping together or making love or fooling around, those describe the act itself. So what we need to be clear about is, yes, we have major concerns about how the language is changing all around us right now. But we also need to be honest about have we allowed it to impact us in previous generations leading up to this generation? Have we given in to pressure from the outside to just water down and not call sin, sin? So what are we listening for? What are we aware of as it relates to this, these front lines of the current moral agenda, moral revolution? Obviously, it starts with pronouns, simple truths. Grammar, and it's, it's fundamental to how we understand each other, how we get along, and how we can make progress by just having terms that are truthful and honest. But it also continues on. You take the past month of June, how just a single word became shorthand for any number of behaviors. Just a single word, pride. No longer pride in anything, but just simply pride. Not, not one of our most celebrated words when we look at truth and we look at what God honors but even aside from that it's become shorthand it's a, a toned down, watered down even a, a celebrated term by so many in the culture and let's divert what we're actually celebrating and let's just honor 
celebration and celebration of identity. There are scientific terms that are beginning to be labeled as offensive. I've got a counselor friend that I try to keep bouncing a lot of these things off of. And, and, and he says, you know, right now there's, there's a, a movement within that counselor culture that says scientific terms like homosexuality or transgender are becoming more and more offensive to patients. Even though that's the science. It's just a simple term. Becoming more and more offensive and thus rejected. What about the term health care? We've already seen it used to allow for abortion, which can be the result of sexual sin. Well, this is mandatory and necessary health care. It should be funded. It should be paid for by everybody. Well, now what about health care to describe unnecessary hormonal treatments, unnecessary plastic surgeries? See, it's a, a misdirection to say, well, this is absolutely necessary. It's, it's health care at risk. Continues on, and we think about words like human rights or sexual minorities. Both of those are growing in their popularity. Those are offensive to those who actually have had their rights trampled on in previous generations, who actually are minorities based on the way they're born or where they're born. These are choices. These are behaviors. And to equate them to rights, to equate them to minorities is a bait and switch. It's a misdirection. It actually ends up being offensive to those who truly are suffering. From a legal perspective, what happens if we misuse some of these terms? You'll see other terms thrown around. Discrimination, violence, terror, abuse, inequality. All of those are responses to those who don't follow produced kind of playbook of language. And again, that's offensive to those who've actually suffered physical violence or suffered actual discrimination. Those sins still happen, but misusing language and using language that's actually true is not inherently violent or abusive. And just recently, in this past month of June, there are even some groups who, when there was any form of resistance, maybe even, say, a sermon like tonight, or some protests over some parades or over some events, that would try to push legislation that would declare a state of emergency over the mistreatment of certain behavioral groups. So think about that again. Like, people suffer when a tornado hits and we declare a state of emergency, or people suffer when a flood happens and, and there's an actual emergency and people's lives are being lost. But when people are offended by speech, and even more than that, truthful speech, it's not a state of emergency. And more and more we're seeing this attempt to redefine anything and everything that touches that agenda. And so it is a downward spiral, a sexualized culture that has this downward spiral. And we must keep resisting that, that pull inward of compromise. It also gets discouraging. Well, where's the good news? Where's the possibility for good? Well, I hope we see just how much good news is in that very same book of Isaiah. Because in a book where God's people are condemned for, in large part for their swapping, for their being influenced by the nations around them, there's also countless promises of hope specifically about Jesus Christ. And that's because Jesus Christ is the answer. He's always the answer to any of our sins, to any of our cultural plights. He promises to give a new name. He promises to give new identity. He promises to give a new future. It's only in Him that we have the brightness of changed lives, of repentance, of a future resurrection. Listen to Isaiah 59 and verse number 20. Same chapter that we just read where people suffered and justice suffered because of a lack of truth. Verse 20, a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turned from transgression. There's a possibility of redemption when repentance happens, when we turn away from sin, ultimately toward Jesus Christ himself. Chapter 62 a few chapters over. Listen to how this connects to these discussions about identity and what we're called. You shall no more be termed forsaken. And he uses the capital F there just to say that your name is such that you've been forsaken. But that shall be no, your name no more. Your land shall no more be termed desolate. 
But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Verse 12, they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. You shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. We get to enjoy those promises of a changed identity and changed names because of Jesus Christ. And don't miss this. What's the dominant image that we read there in chapter 62, especially verses 4 and 5? It's that of marriage. It's of joining together to God for God's purposes. You have to believe that when Paul's writing Ephesians 5 and he's saying, hey, marriage is, is great and wonderful, but know this, it's been pointing to the union with Christ all along. It's great and it's fundamental and it's necessary, but, but there's a union with Christ available to all. And now here, Isaiah, 600 years before Christ, dragging this prophecy about the era of the church and saying, there's a time when you'll be joined to the Lord. You'll be redeemed. Your name will be changed. So see, when we see the watering down of behavior, sexual sin, and the allowing of it, and no longer calling it sin, we're also going directly against God's plan for marriage. And here he's saying the restoration that you will have when you come to Christ is akin to a beautiful, committed marriage to him. You get to be the bride of Christ. And so on two levels, we get to find our identity in God. We know at the end of the day, always, our identity comes from God. Genesis 1:27, when it all starts, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is fundamentally true about every single person who's ever conceived in the womb from the moment they're conceived in the womb. Two things are true about them based on this verse. They have the spirit, the image of God within them. And that same designer assigns them a gender. Male and female, he created them for his glory. But then there's a level of spiritual identity. Those who do Obey Christ, put him on a baptism, who choose to follow him in true repentance. He gives us those new names. And he does so many other things for us that the world and sin can never deliver on. So you go to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians that we referenced last week, that we'll keep referencing. Verse 14, God raised the Lord, he will also raise us up by his power. This body is not all that we have. We have a promise of a future resurrection. Verse 17, he who joined, who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Verse 17, that's that, that echo back to Isaiah 59. There's a joining to the Lord. That's true about a single person. That's true about any married person. That's true about anyone coming out of any sin. That you get to have this existence, this life of walking with the Lord, connected to God. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Something that so many people are deceived in thinking is not possible. God says very much is possible when you're bought and redeemed by the blood of Christ. So Jesus Christ is the answer. He's always the answer. He will always be the answer no matter the struggles of our culture or any given culture or era into the future. Yesterday, Amanda and the girls were watching a, a neat you know, show on uh, Discovery Channel, I believe, and it was about... Uh, a shipwreck off the coast of, coast of North Carolina, USS Pulaski, 1838. Had a lot of rich people on board, and they were going up north for the summer, and they had gotten their gold from the bank. Gold was dated 1837. And not far off the shore, there was a disaster with their steam engines, and the ship exploded, and that ship sank along with all of that gold uncirculated, not dinged at all, covered in the dirt of the seafloor. But when they began to find the evidence of that wreck and pull this gold up to the surface, they began finding these bright, shiny coins that are almost 200 years old. And so the host said, so is this, this legal tender? See, it says 5D. It's $5 gold coins. Is this legal tender? Could I walk into the store and sell it? And the archaeologist who's 
kind of overseeing the project, said, well, I would hope you would come into my store and, and use it as legal tender. Yes, it's possible. I would hope you would because what? He knows it's worth way more than the $5 that it says on it. And so the host asks, well, what's it worth? Maybe five or 6000 a piece? And the guy shook his head and said, these are brand new. They're so old. They have this story. We know where they came from. They're solid gold. They're worth at the low end maybe $30,000 up to $40,000. You can use this coin as if it's worth $5. It's possible. It works that way. But that's not a reflection of its true value. Just because you can doesn't mean it represents what it's actually worth. There's so much more built in to its value. And you have something that is incredibly expensive. And so when we think about our bodies and we think about this constant temptation that revolves around sexual sin and has followed mankind throughout its history, we can use our bodies in one way or the other, the world would say. And so because you can, you should, they would argue. But God says you have so much more value than what you think you have. You have so much more value than what the surface might say. You have value from the one who created you. And you have value from the one who offers to recreate you, to save you and to redeem you. And so tonight, if you don't know that value, if you don't know that the joy and the peace that comes from walking with Christ, walking with Him in repentance, walking with Him in the joy of salvation. We'd love to assist you in making that decision this evening. If you need to put Him on in baptism, the moment where He does wash and sanctify and justify us, if you need to come back to Him, respond to Him, expressing the need to change your life, please know that He is here for you. And as such, we are here for you as well. Would you come now as we sing together?